Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture 19. So we're going to get back to code. It'll be fun. So we have been covering quite a few things. And now we're going to, uh, in these final three lectures, kind of take a little attention to kind of start revising and refining things where we've worked hard in this course and reduced a lot of new concepts, both uh, in languages as well as design concepts, design processes. And by now, you should be comfortable designing modules and implementing them and getting generators going and testing them. And as thanks to last week, we've even seen how to use formal verification to test them, which is really neat. Um, but now we're kind of going to go in and revise a little more, kind of, you know, in that agile iterative process, kind of keep improving, keep making things better. So to kind of outline the next uh, few lectures, today we're going to cover various things involving uh, Chisel, some language details we didn't cover before, and some other little nuances. On Wednesday, we'll be covering more about this kind of open source development as a whole to kind of give appreciation for more of this kind of process at a grander scale. On Friday, we'll be having a, a guest, Jack Koenig from Sci-5, and we'll be talking more about how to prepare for that opportunity. It'll be a wonderful uh, advanced office hour slash mini design review session. And then uh, next week, we'll close by talking about Fertile, which is this technology underlying uh, chisel in between. It's also a nice platform to build our own hardware design tools. So let's get to it. So for today, we're going to first kind of make sure we really get a good mental model for what Chisel is doing, and then talk about how we can best write software and avoid some common mistakes. And better yet, in the spirit of, you know, making the tools do the work, how can we use the language and design patterns to uh, detect errors or prevent errors outright, right? So let's go ahead and load up our notebook. And uh, here we go. Great. So uh, I've been repeating this throughout the course. I think it's good to kind of really hammer home what's going on. So we keep saying we're writing chisel. We're making a chisel design, we're taking a chisel generator. Really, we're actually the Scala developers. You know, spoiler alert, I've turned you all to Scala developers this quarter, right? You're, you're writing legal Scala programs. You're now Scala programmers. Um, if it's not a valid Scala program, right, you've, you've experienced that, right? You get a Scala compile time error, right? You've done that. <laughs> so Chisel is really just a Scala library, right? And in particular, taking advantage of nice features in the language and some clever engineering in Chisel, it looks like its own language. In particular, uh, you know, technically it's referred to as a embedded domain-specific language, right? That is, it's embedded in an existing language. So Chisel is not a standalone, you know, syntax. It's not its own, you know, uh, uh, grammar, right? It's inside of Scala. And it's domain specific, right? We're making something for hardware design. And so what do we do when we write one of these, you know, Scala programs is technically Chisel? Well, we're using this Chisel library and really we're designing hardware. And while we're designing hardware, we're kind of doing two things. We are instantiating pieces of hardware and connecting them together, right? That's really all it is. And all our stuff going on is really kind of uh, using Scala to decide which things to instantiate, you know, which hardware blocks to instantiate, and how to connect them, right? And that cleverness and niceness is the way we can kind of get some really nice parameterization and flexibility for generators, right? But if we wanted to build very straightforward, non-parameterized, you know, fixed single design instances kind of things, uh, you could write that and, you know, you can imagine how it look, right? Virtually every line would be, you know, instantiating an object or connecting it. And there really wouldn't be much Scala, you know, at least Scala, you know, flourish would mostly be very direct code, right? And I think what's worth appreciating is, like I said, you may be instantiating chisel objects and you don't necessarily recognize it, right? For example, uh, anytime you reference something or use it in an operation, you're actually perhaps creating a chisel object, right? So let's say, for example, you do something using a literal uh, for as a uint. Um, that reference, that literal for, is going to create a chisel node that represents that for. And it knows it's a uint, and you know, depending on if you give it a bit width or if it's unspecified, that will remain, right? Additionally, let's say you reference a signal that already exists. I mean, like io.in, which already exists, but let's say you negate it. That's also going to create, you know, a new node, which is going to have the output, you know, created from this is going to be the negation of io.in. It's going to have the input of io.in, right? So all these chisel objects have inputs and outputs. And, you know, the creation of all these things and how they're connected, that's kind of all tracked by some niceness in the Scala library automatically. And, you know, the foothold that makes this possible is when you, you know, inside of a function, say, extends module, you're creating what's called a builder context. There's no place for this to kind of happen. And so 
under the under the hood, you know, it's taking care of stuff, right? Okay, so basically anytime you refer to anything as chisel within one of these builder contexts, i.e. in some place that says extends module, you are creating these objects, right? And then when you want to connect them, well, you know to connect them, right? You uh, use the colon equals operator or the bolt connect operator. Uh, and these really are creating side effects, right? They are mutating these objects by, you know, changing their inputs uh, or changing their outputs, right? And so I said a second ago, right? Really think of your chisel design as just a scholar program that instantiates hardware components and connects them, right? And, you know, we want to build our flexible parameterized generators. We're just thinking about how to use Scala to best structure and think about those things, right? And so uh, if this helps make it easier to figure out what your design problem, right? Your goal is really just to properly connect things, the inputs and outputs, um, and to kind of set things up, right? You don't need to necessarily solve massive challenges, right? Just figure out what components you need to do the computation you want to do and connect them together, right? Um, and so when you think, contrast this kind of way of thinking from perhaps, you know, more conventional software development, right? This is a more spatial, structural kind of thinking, right? Where, you know, in software, you're thinking about how to solve a problem temporally. I know I want to do A, and then I want to do B, and then I want to do C. Um, now we're thinking more about what are the things I want to do and how to connect them all together, right? Um, so, okay, I want to do this operation. Cool, I'm going to do this operation. This operation is going to be first in data flow order, and this operation is next. We'll just connect this to this one, right, et cetera. And uh, as you know, you may have already experienced, right, the tools are pretty smart. They will go in and optimize things. If things are disconnected, they'll get pruned away. This is not a, like a regular software compiler. They'll, you know, do dead code elimination. But cool. So, like I said, you're really just writing a program that's instantiating hardware blocks and connecting them. That's what we're doing. Okay, and so one thing that comes up as a common misconception I want to clarify is something that kind of is being built, uh, you know, on teaching class multiple times and talking to students in office hours and such is really being clear about what is static versus what is dynamic, right? So I think what we're trying to do with Chisel, we're trying to design hardware. So that's going to be a rigid physical thing, right? Um, now, of course, in this class, we aren't actually manufacturing it. We're just using a simulation, but the simulation is trying to be faithful to the notion that this the hardware is fixed, right? Now, after I completed the design phase and start a simulation, the hardware itself is not going to change its structure. Now, just because the hardware structure is static doesn't mean, you know, the wires flowing through it can't have signals that vary, you know, the values on them cycle by cycle, right? Or perhaps even multiple times per cycle, right? So kind of way I summarize this notion is, you know, you can say that, you know, the hardware's connectivity, you know, the structure is, is, is static, right? Basically, when you finish your design and start a simulation or you pass off the CAD tools to be manufactured, right, that structure is static. It's fixed, right? The values it contains, those were the variants. So that's the dynamic portion, right? And so sometimes I think students may get confused and they may think, oh, well, this portion needs to change while it's operating, so I should make this a VAR or something. And no, 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 no. We'll come to VAR in just a second. But the point is, really, all your chisel program needs to do is instantiate components, connect them. You're worried about the structure, right? Now, of course, your structure, if properly designed, will do the right thing dynamically when it's actually operating to have the right values, right? Now, for example, something like a MUX, which we use to select values in hardware, right? The connectivity of the MUX is static, right? It's input zero selected to, you know, way zero, input one selected to way one. There's a select signal. Those wires, the connections don't change, right? The fact, you know, that the output is either way zero or way one, that is, you know, the hardest behavior, but the, structure, the static is structurally, right? And so, as a kind of reminder, right, with subtraction in our class, that wires, you know, are these stateless things that, you know, directly propagates input to the output, right? And so, a wire can change value over time, but that's because the thing that's driving the wire is changing over time, right? Now, of course, we want to save things. We need to use state elements, like registers or memories. And, you know, in this class, we're using synchronous state elements that only change on a rising clock edge. Um, and of course, after a rising clock edge, then the input value becomes the output. And otherwise, you can change input all you want, and the output won't change. And sometimes this is a little bit confusing because in Chisel, one of the niceties is that you know the clock is implicit. So sometimes you forget that oh yes, this register is a state element; it only changes on the register boundary. Or just on most recent homework, sometimes it's confusing when uh, using a sync read memory when you kind of make connections to the read port to kind of remember oh yeah, this is going to be delayed by a cycle because it takes time to read, right? But this is kind of gets mentality, okay, so we're, you know, we're creating this structural thing, and it kind of has these things. And uh, there's this nice uh, congruence between, uh, you know, this kind of structural static thing and actually functional programming, right? Where you think about functional programming, where they're really obsessed about, you know, avoiding mutation 
and thinking about how does you know data flow through a function and how do you kind of compose things. That's actually very similar to what we're doing in hardware, right? We are we aren't doing you know temporal overwriting of things. No, no, no. We are figuring out the operations and connecting them together, right? And so, as I said, in this class, we use Chisel, which is you know a language embedded inside a functional language Scala. There's also something called Clash, which is embedded inside Haskell, another functional programming language, right? So there's a nice congruence there of kind of functional data flow and hardware that kind of all comes together. Okay, so uh, as I kind of remind you, okay, your design is uh, sh static structurally, right? You know, it's, it's not gonna change, but the values can change, right? And so uh, don't for a second confuse the fact that the wires in the existing hardware can change value for mutability in the Scala in your chisel generator, right? Um, just because we reference something as a val or something doesn't mean that wire can't change value in actual hardware. It just means that in the Scala program, uh, you know, it's treated as a val, right? And so val versus var, that's only in a Scala program. When it gets turned into hardware, that, that's lost, right? That's not going to matter, right? Um, and so let's say, for example, uh, you know, you were just starting off, maybe a little bit confused, and you wanted to make a counter in hardware. So you're thinking, oh, well, it's a counter. It needs to change values, right? So I'll declare that a var because I need, I need to change values, right? And I'll initialize it to zero. And then, uh, you know, when I want it, I'll increment it by, you know, setting it to itself plus one. And in most program languages, this would be a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Um, and this is actually a legal scholar program, so I'll compile, right? But uh, realize what you're going to get here, right? Okay, at this point, counter is a reference that points to, uh, you know, when these chisel nodes, it represents the literal zero of, you know, type uint, and of, you know, in this case, unspecified bit width. Now, this next line, what's it going to do? Well, it's going to evaluate the right side and then assign that to the left side, right? So, okay, evaluate the right side. All right, making a literal for 1.u, just like we did for 0.u, we now have a literal for 1.u. Uh, we're going to do a plus operation. Oh, yeah, we got to go access counter. Well, counter is going to point us to the node, you know, the object that already exists for the zero. So we're going to have, you know, this plus operation with the inputs coming from 0.u and 1.u. And then the output has to attach to counter. So now counter as a reference is going to be pointing to the result of this addition. And so uh, we're remembering to, oh, wait, if you talk about this kind of played out. This is going to be 0 plus 1 always, right? This will never change, right? Because... Uh, We've kind of had this here. Remember, we, we've not declared anything to kind of hold a memory in hardware, right? This is kind of software. We kind of attached it or two literals and added them together, but that's not going to uh, do anything. You know, perhaps the uh, optimizing compiler recognized, oh, wait, you know, these are constant plus a constant, so I'll just replace that off the constant as the result, right? So you might even just get the uint literal one and not even have the addition there anymore, right? So now to actually have a chance of this being a counter, we know what we need to do, right? We need to actually store the value in a register, right? And um, connect it, right? Uh, and notice how this is a connection versus reassignment. So one of the niceties of actually having, oops, sorry, uh, of having um, a different operator symbol for connection versus equality or an assignment is that uh, we can use uh, val now for our objects quite easily, right? So we can use val for our, you know, references to our chisel objects. And so we want counter to be this register, right? If we uh, omit this equal sign, I'm oh, sorry, this colon, it's just an equal, then we'll be reassigning counter. Well, guess what? If, vowels, if counter is a vowel, that's not possible. So it's a way for us to kind of use the language to show it. So I have an example of this kind of more clearly in the next slide, but remember here, the point is that the register is going to hold the value, right? And that's got to happen. So what's kind of fun with this example is here I have a case where using a var, it's actually not going to change values because we're, we're adding up together two constants. And in this case, we're using a val, and it actually will work somewhat correctly, right? It actually will change values. Now, you may need to worry about resetting and the bit widths and such, but uh, I was trying to point out that val, var versus val is really just something in the Scala program. If you write the Scala program, it's not going to change the hardware, right? Okay, so uh, I've been trying to get folks to avoid var. Um, and it's one of these things where there are a handful of cases where it's better. Uh, you know, better being it makes the code more readable. Sometimes your performance limit is actually using it makes it a little bit faster. Um, but I find that uh, students tend to be sometimes a little bit uh, when they run into troubles with the functional programming, they you know revert to using var. 
understandable, but I want to encourage you to you know push yourself to try to not use it, right? And I was able to work on this project, Essent, you know, a Scala-based chisel tool um, for years without using VAR, right? So you can really kind of do it. Uh, that might have been a little bit too far to never use VAR for two years, but uh, you get the point, right? It's definitely possible. Um, and so, for example, one error message that came up a lot uh, in the prior quarter, but not this quarter, since we've done a better job teaching the material, is that students would often get this error message from the tools, right? Source escaped the scope for which it was constructed, and they're like, what the heck does that mean, right? And this often came up when students were using a VAR, and it kind of crossed in now a module boundary, right? And, that, and that's kind of what happened, right? But uh, you can get rid of that, right? And then, um, you know, we saw some examples early on in the course about, oh, yeah, we want to do for loops. We can do for with var or something. And, oh, wait, now, you know, change how to do functional programming or recursion. You can sometimes get away, away from that, right? Um, but if nothing else, one thing that often comes up talking to students about val versus var is when they hear about the two things, uh, they kind of hear, oh, wait, var can do more than val, right? You know, var can be reassigned or not reassigned. You can just assign it once versus val can only be assigned once. That seems like it's, you know, strictly less useful, right? So students kind of by default think, oh, I'll use var because I'll use the most capable thing out there. And um, understand that the restriction of val being only assigned once um, isn't a restriction. That's a, that's a feature, right? So maybe rather thinking of it as, oh, var has this feature of being able to reassign itself, I'll think of Val as it has this feature of being able to prevent bugs, right? Ooh, wouldn't that be great, right? You know, how often this quarter have you found yourself limited by your typing speed? Not that often, right? Usually the issue is uh, figuring out your de design or debugging, right? And so, man, wouldn't it be nice to language to help me have less bugs? Val can help you do that, right? So, look at this example here. We're going to show you where Var can. Um, Make some types of bugs really uh, annoying. It's one of these things where, you know, late at night, you know, maybe you meant to use val, but type var because you use var all the time, and you have this little mistake, and you see what happens. Okay, so what, what's this module trying to do? Well, this module is basically like a ReLU, right? You know, that thing we covered earlier, you know, where you have a signed input coming in. If it's negative, we're going to set it to zero. We're kind of threshold it, right? And uh, if it's greater than zero, we're not going to modify it at all, right? So... One way to explain this, you know, we can do this with, you know, a wire and, you know, use a when. And so originally we're just going to pass it straight through. And of course, if it's negative, we'll sign zero. Take advantage of that last connect semantics. And boom, we have it, right? So we go ahead and run this. Uh, it should work just fine. I mean, we'll zoom out so you can see it. We're actually just barely, oh, no, it doesn't quite just barely fit. Okay, so yeah, you know, this is kind of what we expected, right? Where it's actually just going to basically do a mux, you know, our whens get turned into a mux. And then, you know, if it's negative, we're going to, you know, put out zero. Otherwise, we're going to not modify it. And of course, because it's sent, we have to keep telling the Verilog it's signed. Okay. So uh, now I'll show you the danger, right? Late at night, slight mistake happens, and you're getting the wrong result. You don't know why. What if, oops, you had forgotten that colon? Really hard to spot that. You're scanning your code, and you're tired, or whatever. Oh my gosh, that's a completely different module, right? Uh, it's always returning zero, right? And we, we know what's happening, right? That we're reassigning W to be zero, last connects, or not even last connect semantics, last assignment semantics, right? So W is no longer a wire, right? W is now just a literal S. And so it's important to remember that this, you know, when statement, we know that in the hardware, it's going to lead to muxes. However, from the point of view of executing a Scala program, the internals of the when definitely are executed, right? And I declared something outside of this when and then modified it in there, it's still going to be modified after that when, right? So this conditionality is not going to be captured in um, the assignment to W, right? Uh, it'll, if a connection to W, yes, but assignment, no. The assignment may be using, you know, var and equal, right? So this is bad, right? You, you don't want this, right? Now, let's say, for example, if uh, instead of having it be a var, uh, you know, I made this a val originally. Okay. Made this a val originally. Get the exact same hardware. Like I said, var versus val in the chisel doesn't really change the hardware, but it does the right thing. But it can help you, right? In this case, if you forgot that symbol, boom. Compiler is telling you you got a problem. Where is my bug? There's my bug. Won't even let me compile, right? This is helpful, right? Use the tools to help you. In this case, use val whenever possible and really try to avoid var. And I can help you avoid reassignment. And that way you remind yourself, oh, yes, I meant to connect. And to connect, I have to use that extra operator. Now, 
Um, to kind of uh, answer a question from chat, I forgot to mention beginning earlier today's lecture. This actually is unfortunately an encore. We're yet another problem of recording, so I'm giving an encore lecture while uh, reading the chat log to replay some of these questions. Someone asked, well, can you remind us of how this, you know, when the muxes plays out? Yes, happily. So um, maybe it's better if I uh, quickly uh, show the alternative. Uh, so the alternative would be, I say w is, let's say, a mux on io.in. If it's true, oh, sorry, uh, io.in less than 0.s, right? If it's true, so let's kind of figure what's happening, right? The transformation and chisel tools that are turning our when into muxes, because it needs to turn to mux for hardware. When is not a verilog construct, right? So what's it going to do? It's going to um, take the condition from the when and use that as a select signal. And then for every connection made inside there, it's going to make that connection. Uh, it's going to, if everything connected to, it's going to assign it either a new value or an old value, right? Now the new value, this condition is true, right? So if this condition is true, we want to connect it to this new value. So that's going to be 0.s, right? Uh, and uh, if it's this when is not true, we want to leave it unmodified. We want to leave it as the old value of uh, w, right? So in this case, actually, oops, I maybe I should have left the wire intact and um, done this, right? And it's a combo loop, right? Um, better yet, why don't I just directly assign the output? Because I think we know kind of what we're doing here. Um, right? Uh, that's the point, right? Is we we want to kind of have a thing. So that's what basically the, all the when is, right? It's basically saying these are connections that are only happening, right? These connections inside a when block only happen when the connection is true. Otherwise, you know, it's like it's, this never happened, right? So how do we do that? Well, we take the old value, pass it into the false path of a mux, right? The new value goes into the true path, and then the condition for the when uh, goes right here. And as you can see, now that I hopefully got this right, the hardware is exactly the same, right? So, yeah, I mean, whens basically are going to produce muxes. Now, stylistically, you might ask yourself, hmm, what should I like better? Do I like this, uh, you know, when, or do I like this single line mux? For a single line mux, maybe that's tempting. Maybe it looks pretty good. Um, I, I, I think that could be arguably cleaner code, right? I think the when becomes really clear when you start having multiple things being connected to uh, in the mux. Because you imagine what it looked like, right? If I have multiple things, multiple connections inside the same when statement, uh, if I write that out manually, it'll be multiple muxes that all have the exact same condition, right? And yeah, I mean, uh, you could read that, you can understand that, but sometimes it's nice to kind of have this. And also when you start doing things like else when or nesting when, we've been using when all quarter. It's handy, right? But think about more about what it's doing, right? As I said before, you know, static structurally, right? Even though in our head, this kind of like conditional, we're kind of maybe having a very faint association of something like if, remember that the structure is static, right? It's going to be a mux. The mux just happens to dynamically choose based on a select signal and choose one of these output inputs to make its output, right? But the structure is static, right? That's what you're doing. You're chiseling, making a static structure, you know, etching out hardware with, a, you know, the metaphor, a chisel, right? Cool. Okay, double checking to make sure I didn't miss any of the questions that were asked. Great. All right, so let's keep going, right? So um, hopefully I've convinced you that, you know, you want to really avoid var for the most part, and you can use val in a lot of places. Um, now, similar to that, uh, are mutable collections, right? So remember you can have a mutable collection, like an array buffer, which you can, you can change the values of, and you can reference it with a val, right? So the val controls what a references. So it's always going to point to the same array buffer. It's just the array buffer can change values, right? Now there's sometimes you do need a mutable collection, right? And we actually encouraged you to use them for homework three because at that point we hadn't really covered how to do functional programming yet, so you kind of needed to do it, right? But it turns out you can often avoid it. It's not always something you need to do, right? Um, and there are a handful of cases where maybe, like I said before, maybe using either var or using a mutable collection will make your code cleaner and better and you should do it, but especially in this case, this course, where you're just trying to learn things and test things out, see if you can't try out and not, not use it, right? Okay, so 
for example, let's say you're doing something where you want to end up with, you know, an array buffer where you increment all the values, right? So, okay, you could, you know, use tablet to populate it and then use a fold to go in and increment them, right? And I argue that this is, uh, you know, even though it seems like a very classic code, this is not great, right? Um, because there's kind of multiple things going on here, and multiple things going on here are kind of distracting uh, from what's actually happening, right? The goal is to add one to every element in your array buffer, right? That's the goal. Um, or really, that I should say, to have something where everything's incremented by one. And you have all these concepts going on, where you have to kind of enumerate the range. In this case, I didn't, you know, um, set this to be a dot size, and you know, so there's a chance, you know, these two different numbers being repeated are wrong. But you know, there's array axes in here. Um, there's mutation, and also for loop, you notice know, iteration is happening, right? And there's no loop carry dependence, right? It's just you know independent iteration. So uh, the notion of iteration is also kind of you know a distraction, right? Really, what we're just trying to do is get a collection and then add one to it, right? And so we've, we've learned how to do this, right? Just take those elements, for each element, add one, right? And so really, what's happening is that there's all this kind of fluff around us, right? There's this iteration. There's generating the index range. There's the accessing, right? There's noting this is an iterator, right? All this kind of stuff's going on. And really, all that matters is the actual transformation performing, which is adding one to the element, right? And so, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we had a way to kind of capture that pattern? We do. It's map, right? Uh, we want to touch every element with a one-to-one -one thing. You know, one element comes in, one element comes out. That's a map, right? And transformation replying, add one to it. You got it. Um, in this case, it's actually even nicer because actually you actually can label each step, right? You can have the original collection and now we have a new collection, right? And by using a seek, both the, uh, the collections themselves are immutable. So they can't be changed, right? This is good. Uh, and you'll find quite often in your chisel designs that you can actually really get by of seeks, right? You can use seeks to hold um, a, a collection of chisel objects you've instantiated, and it works just fine. So actually, the ray buffer, you really don't use too often, perhaps even less often than var. If you use a ray buffer, it's probably actually going to be used in your Scala functional model, less likely in the actual chisel generator, right? Like I said, we've been covering functional programming. If you actually do some sort of loop carry dependence, you can use things like fold left or reduce, um, etc. Cool. Okay, so I'm checking the notes. Doing great. Okay. Um, let's keep going. Okay, so kind of in that same spirit of trying to help improve readability, we really want to um, encourage you to make code that uh, has a limited number of special cases, right? Now, early on in the quarter, when, for example, teaching how to use ifs inside your generators, you know, we had like two cases, and then you kind of did have to code each special case separately, right? And uh, for some small numbers of parameter values, you know, there's only a couple of options, handling special case directly is totally reasonable, right? But uh, in some other cases, it's going to be very not scalable, right? Especially if we have a lot of parameter values that are possible. And so what you want you to do is I want you to figure out, kind of recognize uh, how to reduce your special cases, right? Now, many times you can figure out, figure your design in a more general way, and you can um, uh, kind of make a more general code that does the right thing. As we saw in the network design case study, uh, you know, uh, lecture, for example, we kind of replaced multiple lines with just a single fold left. And by kind of using that initial seed value into our fold left, we're kind of able to handle zero months very gracefully. Other places in Chisel handle zero months really well. For example, you know, you can have something that's zero bits wide and that's, you know, it does the right thing inside the uh, hardware. Um, you know, if you have a one entry memory, it's not going to have some of a zero bit address and it doesn't even need an address. It does the right thing. Like a lot of these things kind of gracefully do the right thing as so you can kind of handle so you anything, anything special, right? You can kind of just do this, right? And if not, if there's other cases that you know you aren't handling, but they are, are necessary, you can limit that. You can put in, you know, asserts and requires that kind of uh, prevent them from happening, right? And so, yeah, that's one thing that's kind of come up is really hoping to have, you know, sometimes you're going to handle special cases directly, but if you can, try to make more general code. There's also one of those great opportunities for you to do something in revision where, you know, get a single instance working, then try to parameterize and get multiple instances, kind of multiple variants kind of going, and then figure out how to refactor it so that you know what, those multiple variants share the same code, right? Kind of, you know, that incremental way, build your way up. Cool. Um, now, sometimes people are using language or like, oh wait, there's four and four each. Um, how would I use them within the chisel generator? Of course, there's a scholar, there's certain functionalities, but you know, 
specifically from the chisel generator, how much you use four and four each. Um, really, they're best for creating connections, right? Like I said, there's kind of two things we're doing in chisel where you're instantiating harder blocks and connecting them. Uh, for instantiating harder blocks, uh, I recommend uh, using something like seek.tabulate, is a really common, or seek.fill, those are really common ways of doing it, or recursion. Or for loops, probably not ideal. Uh, also, if you're using for loop to create harder blocks, you're probably also going to be using immutable collection or something. And yeah, I don't like where that's heading. Um, so you're mostly using for and for each for making connections, right? And so for iterating through all the possible cases you need to connect, what do you try and do? Well, making a connection is one of these things where there's not anything really returned, but it has a useful side effect, right? The side effect is we now have mutated these chisel objects and now have you know, a connection between them, right? We've connected the input of one, modified that field, the input field, to be the output of the other thing, right? We've made it happen, right? Now, sometimes there's cases where we want to make connections and also get, you know, the objects back. If we want the objects back and we want a result, of course, then we need to use map, right? But, okay, let's say we're just doing uh, connections. We don't need a result back. We only want the side effect for connections. Now, this is my own opinion, opinion here, but I feel like if the thing already exists and it's already a collection, for each is really graceful, right? We can just iterate through each element and do for each, right? Now, maybe you have connecting two connections, right? Each element and two connections, two collections, right? Well, then maybe you can zip them together and then do a for each, right? So if the collections already exist and the ranges already exist, um, yeah, I think for each is really nice. Now, there you call for each on the collection, right? So you know, if we have a collection that already exists, we can call for each on it. If we um, have a collection and want to do another collection, we can, of course, have that collection, zip it, and then call for each. That's valid. Right, we've done that, right? Now, there's some cases where maybe uh, you're going to want to manually construct the range you're indexing rather than just taking the entire collection. Or you're actually going to index into things, right? You're going to say, you know what? I want to take, you know, I from this collection, but I want to be like I plus two in this other collection, right? Now we know we can use zip with index and for each, right? That's been done, right? So zip with index is kind of a nice way to kind of get that index variable back in the functional world. Works just fine. Stylistically, if you really um, need to use an index variable, I think for is, is convenient, right? Um, Additionally, if you need to create the range, right? So let's say, for example, you had to go like, you know, zero until n, then dot for each. To me, it's a little bit weird syntax. I would just say four and then, you know, make i zero to n. And so if you're creating the range or you need an x variable, those are the cases where me personally, style-wise, I think the four is more clean. But that's an opinion. That's not as hardcore. This is more, you know, a nuance here. A few slides ago, trying to get you to use val instead of var, that's more of a, you know, or else kind of situation. Um, and that opinion comes up sometimes looking at students' code is talking about how to, you know, best work with the logic, right? And, uh, you know, I keep saying make the tools do the work. Um, and so in that case, you know, sometimes I would, you know, not make you worry too much about doing optimization manually. Understand that it's pretty rare you can be able to optimize logic better than the CAD tools, right? Because understand not only are they really good at these algorithms and they can consider many possible things, the CAD tools are also going to know the costs in your final technology, right? So when you actually are mapping this to a technology, whether it be an FPGA or an ASIC, they're going to know the costs for various logic gates. And so they're going to know what really matters, right? And they're also going to know which is a critical path. And they're going to, you're going to work the work really hard to outdo your CAD tools. That being said, there are certain things you can do, uh, perhaps inadvertently or perhaps carelessly, you know, that either make it hard for the CAD tools to optimize, um, or just make the code harder to read, right? So normally my goal is, you know, write code in a way that is, you know, number one, correct, and number two, easy to read. Uh, and that's kind of the goal, easier to maintain. But give some more concrete examples of things where the CAD tools can't quite optimize, but you as a human can do things a little better. Uh, let's talk about like 2D grids, for example. So we've had this come up in multiple cases, like the game of life, or in, you know, the matrix multiplication assignment, we have to kind of use 2D grids, right? And so uh, a 2D grid normally is humans. So we like to think of those as being addressed with two dimensions, right? Like a row and a, a column, right? And uh, that works great. Now, depending on how it's implemented, you might need to implement that with a one dimensional backing, one dimensional address, right? And this happens all the time. Like, you know, even in software, right? You know, the memory in computers is usually addressed in one dimension. 
So yeah, somehow your 2D uh, arrays turn into, you know, a 1D address space, right? And usually, you know, with languages, you things like being row major, right? You know, this entire one row, an entire next row, an entire next row, etc. That's pretty standard. And so I think when people do this in hardware, some cities did the exact same thing. They built a, you know, uh, 1D mem that, you know, kind of had a row major or column major. And then, you know, when you need to kind of do the right math to access it in the right ways, they would do things like using like the modulus, the remainder, or, you know, div operations, divide operations to get the rows and columns and that kind of things. And, you know, when they need to reconstruct a single address, you know, single index from the, you know, row and column numbers, they would kind of use the multiplication operation to kind of put them back together. And so realize that, you know, in this case, the tools probably can't optimize this, right? They aren't going to be able to recognize, oh, wait, you're doing a 2D grid, you should have done this instead. No, no, they're, they're going to give you what you asked for. And understand that, you know, divide and modulus are pretty expensive operations. Uh, so is multiplication, right? So this is a fixed situation where you have quite expensive hardware and you don't really need it, right? And so, for example, if you're able to instead have separate uh, addresses, you know, for row and column and, you know, and declare your memory is 2D and to um, that sort of thing, that works just fine. So, for example, how much you declare 2D memory in Chisel? Well, you could declare a mem and the type inside there could be vec. Perfectly valid, right? And, you know, instead of having a single counter for the current location and trying to be clever how you reset it, you could have two counters, right? One for row, one for column, right? So it's kind of an example of something where making, and this arguably also perhaps is easier to read code, right? Rather than seeing this kind of weird arithmetic in line to code trying to, you know, parse out this is a row, this is a column, you can just say, hey, just call it, name that variable row, right? And you can see what's going on. So it's one of those things where maybe the first time you do it, this will make sense to you, then, you know, maybe you do a code review with a colleague and you're like, oh, wait, mm, you know, maybe you can do it this different way. This one's different ways you should consider. Another difference you should consider is when you're accessing bits, right? So sometimes folks, um, you know, they want a certain few bits from a number. In a program language, you're very familiar with how to use the shift operators and maybe a mask up to and, you know, to pull things off. Um, we've done that, right? But that's not necessarily in software. You don't need to do that in Chisel, right? In Chisel, uh, you can just access the bits, right? You can say, hey, I want starting from here to here. This is inclusive, right? You can just give a single bit by only giving one number in that parentheses. You can also use the tail and head methods like other uh, Scala collections, right? Better yet, you can also concatenate things with the cat operator, right? So, um, you know, even though you're very familiar with all this kind of bit twiddling stuff in software, in hardware, we can kind of do things directly, right? And that's kind of nice. So. Once again, I sometimes argue, you know, if you want to, you know, access a few bits of a number, this is a lot more readable than somebody who's going to manually generate a mask and then shift things and pull it out. Oh my gosh, right? The CAD tools may recognize it's a static shift and actually turn infer you meant to do a bit select, but maybe they won't, right? Because it's such a weird thing for people to do. Um, but this is one of the things where this is, code is definitely more readable and really kind of better. And like I said, the kind of, any place you can look to find ways to reduce complexity and kind of confusion, uh, let's try and do that, right? In this case, there's these nice features built in. Um, and if I can mention this a few times in this course, like you mentioning it, I linked to on the course homepage under Scala to Pavel's blog post about, you know, underappreciated uh, Scala features. And he has all these examples of things that are perfectly valid Scala, but there's actually like a nice Scala method that kind of does that compactly and more clearly, right? And so kind of in that spirit, let's do that. Um, so... This is a style thing. This is not going to uh, necessarily save you bugs like using val instead of r, um, but this can still help. So what are we talking about? Well, remember when I said how whenever you reference a chisel thing, it's going to instantiate a hardware block? And even though it's inside of a when block, it's not like the hardware vanishes and in one case is not true. Remember, it's static structurally, right? So this hardware, this in this case, this counter, it's always going to exist. All this when is doing is just you know creating a mux that connects to this counter, right? Um, the counter is always going to exist. So this kind of gives you a flexibility, right? Where you can kind of instantiate models, modules within when blocks or outside when blocks. Sometimes for me, I find it easier when you're kind of writing a module for people to kind of read and understand what's going on to pull this out, right? Now, this is not required. This is a style choice. And the reason why is, you know, if someone wants to know what tech this module has inside of it, they can see, oh, wait, it's a counter and then oh yeah, how's the counter connected, right? So sometimes it's kind of almost like old school C to kind of pre-declare your variables to kind of pre-declare the modules declared within this module. People kind of are aware of what's going on and then go from there. Style choice, right? Uh, both will uh, produce 
the same hardware. So here's, you know, with the new layout I made, I can also revert that and it's going to be the same thing. Okay. Um, so like before, we could also um, make this, uh, let's say we declare this outside. We could also, uh, you know, give it that much treatment like we just did a, sec a few slides ago, right? So we could say, you know, instead of doing when, uh, I just want to say, hey, io.out colon equals mux. What's the condition? Well, the condition is io to n. What's the new value? The new value is going to be count, right? And what's the old value? The old value is going to be zero, right? Um, so the exact same hardware, right? So yeah, so once again, we kind of had this debate, you know, for a single line mux, is it better to have, you know, a when statement or a mux? I think that's very debatable, right? Uh, except for me personally, style-wise, I also like to said it was a substantial module, like to pull it out of the when statement. It was a tiny module and it's not really important. Maybe you don't bother. Um, like I said, think about someone reading your code and they're trying to figure out what's going on, what kinds of things um, will happen, right? So I said, things declared inside whens are always going to exist, right? They're always going to happen. Now, the difference, of course, is if it's a Scala if, right? Now, Scala if is truly conditional. And depending if the if is true or false, that line may or may not get evaluated. But inside of when, it's always going to be evaluated. That model is always going to exist. It's just a question of uh, the connections, right? And we said here, the when statement is going to build this mux for us, right? Now, going back from the questions, uh, a student asked, oh, wait, if I declared, you know, uh, this inside um, the uh, when block, does that remove the need for me to give this default value? Uh, doesn't really change that, right? The issue is, um, the issue we're running into is that, you know, I ought to out, uh, you know, if we don't have this, uh, I ought to out is underspecified, right? Um, and the reason why is, you know, what's the default, what's the value for I ought to out if this is not true, right? So you can see here that, you know, fertile pass has produced this mux we were just talking about, right? You know, selecting I to n, the new values count. Yeah, you got it. But, oh, shoot, what's the value to, uh, you know, I out out otherwise? There is no value, right? So this is not true. We can't put void in hardware, right? That's why it's complaining. So no, we the, the scope of this is going to change where count's available. So for example, I can't write this code and then use count down here because, you know, um, Scala has kind of this, you know, braced scope, like a lot of programming languages you come across, right? For example, you know, uh, within these braces, you know, things declared within here are not going to escape there, right? Uh, and so now count is only exists within the scope beside the when. So perhaps we have a very big module. Some of people have models that are hundreds of lines long. Not necessarily a mistake. In software, if you underline function, you probably did something wrong. Sometimes in hardware, it's hard to avoid these for some cases. If you try to chop it up smaller in some cases, you end up with like, you know, 80 lines of interfaces and you'd rather just put it into 200 line modules. So some, some modules and big projects actually are. 200 300 lines and it's not a design failure. Um, in that case, um, maybe pulling your modules into the WENs isn't a bad idea because that we can kind of keep all the codes related near each other. So, you know, this selection of this chisel code all works together. So we should have all the things collocate things. And also the scope, right? You know, something like count's a very generic name. Perhaps in a 200 line module, you're going to have multiple things that are count like. And maybe you have an inverted name alias or something. Um, Val can help you from perhaps accidentally overwriting it, uh, but still not perfect. So it, it can vary, but yeah, we're gonna need that default value. And then the other question from Chow, which I kind of just indirectly answered was about, uh, you know, yeah, can you elaborate more on the scopes? Yeah, like I said, the braces kind of define the scope. So for example, if I, right now, you know, count and wrap are only valid inside these braces, right? If I pull it out one level, um, it's now going to next level braces, which is this entire class, which is, you know, extends a module. And so now it's valid for all of that, right? But yeah, same working hardware. Cool, great questions. Okay. Um, so let's keep going. Um, another small Scala thing, kind of like in the spirit of things Pavel was talking about, is you know, Mer Scala has both until or to, right? So as programmers, we're very familiar with, oh yeah, occasionally, oops, I need to change this range. I need like, you know, n plus one, n minus one, something. Well, um, we can make that by changing until and to, right? So for example, let's say I want to print out zero through three. 
And then, um, you know what? I want to now be inclusive. Well, I can just change that word rather than instead doing, you know, n plus one, which would also give the same thing, you know, use the features of the language. This is arguably is a little bit cleaner, right? Um, cool. So this is a small point. This is like a style thing, right? Uh, one thing I've covered before and I want to hammer home very explicitly, clearly that's kind of why it's on the slide, is require versus assert. So if you're using one of these op uh, commands, you're doing something right. But actually, if you were to try and count, there is require provided by Scala. There is a uh, assert provided by Scala. There's also an assert provided by Chisel. So that's three different versions, right? Okay, so let's kind of talk about what's going on, right? So let's do assert first, and we'll come, we'll come to require. So for assert, there's a Chisel version of it and the Scala version of it. And you say, wait a second, how do I know which one I'm calling? They're both assert. Yes, the exact same keyword, right? This is an overloaded function. The one that's going to be called is determined by the type it's operating on. If you're operating on a Chisel thing, i.e. a bool, you get the Chisel assert. If you're operating on a Scala thing, i.e. a Boolean, then you get the Scala one. So usually in an assert, you have some sort of comparison, you know, equals, not equals, less than, something. And so based on what you're comparing, if you're comparing Chisel things, you're going to get a Chisel bool result, and thus you're going to call it a Chisel assert. If you're comparing Scala things, you're going to get a Scala Boolean and get the Scala assert, right? Um, and if you, let's say you compare a Chisel thing to a Scala thing, you're going to get a compile time error because you can't compare it to you, right? You need to, you know, uh, do the right conversions or whatever. Usually, if you have a Chisel thing compared to a Scala thing, usually you're meant to cast that Scala thing also to a Chisel thing, right? Making a dot .u or something. And so with these assert methods, um, let's kind of appreciate a second what happens when you have a Scala one versus a Chisel one. Well, they actually do different things. So the Scala one is evaluated when your Chisel design generator is running as a Scala program. And so once design, you know, generation is complete, you know, elaboration is completed, it no longer checks anything, right? Versus the Chisel one is going to be, uh, you know, evaluated or, you know, checked while your design is being simulated. Now, a Chisel assert is not going to end up in the final hardware. It's only available in simulation, right? So if you simulate your design, that's an assert there. If you turn it into an FPGA or onto an ASIC, the tools won't do that. And the, way, the reason why it happens is they use something called non synthesizable Verilog. They know it's Verilog that tools know only makes sense for vet simulation and not for otherwise, right? And like I said, we can, you can put in a nice failure message in there to make it more clear, which we'll is a second in just a second. Um, and so, yeah, and so let's think about how we're using these, right? Well, if you're using a chisel assert, we're actually checking the value of something in the hardware while the hardware is actually operating, right? So under simulation, I want to make sure this wire has the right value and you have an assert checking that. That's what you're doing, right? Versus a Scala assert, you know, runs during instruction and elaboration time, not during simulation time, right? So really what you're doing is you're kind of checking the state of your program for the structure, right? Making sure that I'm doing the right things for that. Um, and so there'll be times when you may want that. However, to be honest, I suspect the Scala assert you're going to use less often, and which you probably really want to use is the require. So independent of chisel, Scala already has require and assert. So what's the difference, right? Uh, they're both evaluated at runtime when your program's running in Scala, right? Uh, the difference is what they return, right? So if you fail an assertion or an assert statement, you get one type of exception. You fail an acquire, you get a different type of an exception. So having different types of exceptions makes it possible for you to kind of catch and handle them differently. Stylistically, you're supposed to use require to check the sanity of inputs. Versus assert is for checking internal, you know, your own operations internally, right? And so what's interesting, for example, is, you know, people will often uh, be quite generous with assert statements to help debug things and test things, but maybe they want to remove those in production code to go faster, right? And actually, you can do that. You can give a flag to the Scala compiler, you know, go change your SPT settings, and it will compile a version of your program without the Scala asserts. But the requires aren't going anywhere. The requires are staying in there, right? Making sure you still have valid inputs, right? Um, so I think for most people in this course, what I would highly recommend is for you to use require on your generators to make sure the parameters giving generator makes sense. So you're making sure the number they're giving you is something you can handle. If it's something you can handle, you should use require to make sure they can't do that to you. 
um, and then use the assert for chisel, right? And the Scala assert, uh, you probably don't need it. Maybe you'd use it in your Scala functional model, right? Um, one thing about asserts is people often ask, well, where should I put them? How do I know how to put them? Um, usually what they're best for is for invariance, right? When you're reasoning about your design, there's some property you kind of know this needs to be true and this is not true, you know, bad things. Trademark TM is going to happen, right? And maybe when you write it the first time, that's not apparent. You kind of figure the logic of your design, you kind of have this invariant, you code it up and you kind of trust the invariant and then you have a bad a bug and it's actually a, a gnarly bug, it takes you a day to find it and you fix it. And at some point you're like, oh man, that was such a subtle bug. I didn't realize this happens. And then you realize, oh wait, at some point you trace back, there was some invariant about your design that probably wasn't true anymore, right? And so the bug you saw, part of the subtle ones that are hard to catch, it's actually sometimes it's tricky because it's like so far downstream, right? Where there's some subtle corruption, some subtle flaw introduced early on, took a few cycles or hundreds of thousands cycles to manifest, right? And so uh, what you want to use these asserts for is to kind of enforce these invariants, right? Now you may know what, what they are at design time, but maybe you don't. But after spending a lot of time catching a hard to find bug, make sure you add asserts into your code. Rather than say, oh, found a bug, fixed it, not gonna happen again. No, no, there's some invariant that was broken make sure you put an assert in to catch that invariant violation and uh, you can catch that happen print this in the future. Remember, just because you spent all this time fixing this bug, you know, your coworker, such as your code a year from now, may not know this invariant, right? Make this invariant clear by having an assert statement. And let's say they're changing design and this invariant is no longer going to be true. Well, then they're going to have to acknowledge that when they see the assert being violated and have to go and understand what's going on, right? So it's one of those things where you know, it might seem like extra work, but trust me, this saves you work in the long time, right? You're going to have less bugs in the long run. You're going to find your bugs faster. Be, be generous of asserts, right? It can really help you. Um, cool. So here's a little example, uh, you know, showing a chisel uh, generator, you know, and like I said, you're probably going to use require on the input parameters and we can use assert on the hardware, right? So um, in the hardware, you know, it turns into non sensible Verilog. And the search is actually two things. It's both checking condition, and if the condition is not true, it's going to kill the simulation. So that's this portion, right? Uh, you know, if this variance is not held, it's going to kill things. But you also, if that variance not held, you also want to tell the user what happened, right? So Chisel nicely um, will tell you, you know, it's an assertion failure. It'll actually give you the line number, which in this case, because it's a notebook, it's a little bit uh, less helpful because it's kind of, you know, anonymous. Uh, file name in a way, actually gives you the line and also even includes, uh, you know, the thing you want them to know, right? Like here's the invariant that, you know, it uh, broke, right? Um, and so, yeah, this is, you know, chisel objects. So we get a chisel assert. This require, of course, uh, you know, check an input parameter. If I put assert here, perfectly valid Scala, it's still going to blow up with someone if they give the wrong width, but like I said, stylistically, it's better to use require. Cool. Um, let's keep going. So, um, kind of as one final little detail here, we're talking about flattening and unflattening bundles, which uh, I consider a real sign of progress for the Chisel Core developers. I'm talking about this, you know, at the end of the quarter, right? So, Chisel's really nice. Let's just kind of have this very heavily typed, strongly typed hard design system where we have, you know, collecting things and you need to make sure bit match up, we need to make sure types match, we need this nice structure of our bundles. Uh, it's really great. Um, occasionally, there's times where, you know what, we need to kind of forget the structure and, you know, get a raw bus of wires and do things with it and get back to it, right? And the number of times that's been necessary has been vastly shrinking, right? So, you know, uh, 10 years ago in early versions of Chisel, yeah, that, that was something people had to think about and do. But um, now, not as much, right? Um, sometimes you do it is actually quite less, right? And so one of those cases where it still comes up is actually with memories. So what, what, what are we talking about here? Well, normally with a memory, if you, you can give it not just a simple u interessant, you actually can give it like a, a type, in this case, a bundle. So if we go ahead and look at the generated uh, Verilog, we will see, uh, you know, oh yeah, so pair is, you know, two fields, A and B. Actually, when it gets turned into Verilog, it's gonna get turned into two memories, right? A 2 v 6 element 
memory of 7-bit things and 256 element thing of 1-bit things for A and B. The reason why is vanilla Verilog doesn't allow us to kind of have this structured mem, doesn't have a bundle equivalent in this sense. And so these are kind of be separate memories, right? And sometimes this is, this, is, this is not just taking advantage of the underlying language, but also this is good. Sometimes having you know, things broken apart allows for better hardware optimization, design optimization, you know, better use of the CAD tools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so by default, you, know, you give it a you know, aggregate type to a mem, you know, an aggregate to either a VEC or a bundle, it's going to make a separate mem for every element or every field, which is a good thing. That's why it's a default behavior. Now, for an optimization point of view, maybe you really want these things to be in the same memory, right? It's actually better to have a single you know, memory of 8-bit words, right? Um, in which case, then you kind of want to, quote unquote, flatten this bundle, kind of remove that type information while it's in the memory and then to restore it, right? So we can do that. Uh, as follows, right? You can see we're still going to declare the mem. Just now we're making it uint, so we're kind of removing information. Actually, it turns out you can call get width on the bundle to get the width of all the fields added together. And um, assuming the bundle widths are known, the field widths are known. And you also can uh, cast a uint to actually a bundle. So that's what we're doing. And then you see how this runs. You don't know where the details, but the result is, yeah, now we have a 256 element memory that has 8-bit uh, elements, right? So that's cool. Now, to be honest, this is this is still brittle, right? So I would not play with this too much. For example, one interesting concern is let's say instead of you know calling get width, let's say I was a little bit more sloppy and you know uh, put in the number six. What happens? Uh, it produced hardware. Okay, well. We know that this bundle is 8 bits and this memory is 6 bits wide, so it's, what does it actually do? Uh, well, it, as requested, give us a memory of 6 bit wide elements, so it did what it was told. When it came time to cast io.out, you can see that uh, it's going to go ahead and you know, give A to the top bit and you know, B for the next set of bits. Okay, that's the right bit extraction field we should have. However, uh, we notice memory is only six bits wide. So where does iOutWire underscore one come from? And we can see, oh wait, uh, it's concatenating some zeros on there to fill in the bits that we didn't assign. So yeah, uh, not good, right? So this, this is not good. We kind of had some problems. And so what's my advice here? Well, my advice is this is a really subtle nuance to be aware of. You probably don't need to use it, right? Uh, as always, whenever I talk about performance optimizations, uh, if it's something that's going to change resource usage until you actually know your resource usage, I would hold off doing it, right? Um, and make sure you're not the thing you're talking about, your alternative you're proposing isn't any more efficient. Maybe the CAD tools can optimize the one you have really well and you don't even realize it. It could also be the case that um, the thing is just really small and the complexity of the optimization you're trying to do perhaps this isn't worth the effort. Um, and so, yeah, don't optimize for resource usage until you actually know what your usage is. <laughs> Uh, and have a way of running it through backend and seeing that. And of course, for the most part, we haven't really used the backend, so that's, you don't know your usage, that's fine. But just keep in mind that, right? Just like in software, you know, people say premature optimization is the root of all evil. Same thing in hardware, right? Don't optimize the resource usage until you know you need it. But just in case you're curious, if you need to somehow break out of this structured world, this is how you do it. One other case where this comes up sometimes, let's say maybe you have a Verilog black box, right? Something that's kind of so opaque, thing you want to pass the outside world. and Maybe there you, for some reason, need to have this be a single, uh, you know, field, right? So there's a way to kind of, you know, flatten and unflatten uh, bundles. Well, cool. So uh, that wraps up today's, you know, grab bag of kind of these chisel features. And hopefully I've kind of convinced you some ways to kind of make your code a little tidier, remove some myths or, or when I miss uh, questions or, you know, cons you know, about how things worked or kind of um, other things to do. And we'll kind of keep going on the same style about how to kind of make things better. So I said... Um, once this lecture will cover more about open source design practices and just in general. Friday, special guests will be great, uh, talking more about kind of many design reviews. And then Monday, we'll be closing talking about fertile kind of thing underlying the whole system. Okay, folks, have a good day.